Welcome all to this session of censorship and information control during information revolutions. So let's start with introductions. Uh, how about if you go first, Will? Sure. My name is Will Slaughter. Uh, I'm a historian and I'm interested in the history of news publishing and the history of copyright. And I've just finished a book which tries to combine those two histories in thinking about questions of ownership of news over a long period of time. Uh, Siva, could you go next, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, this is Siva Vadianathan. I am a professor at the University of Virginia. Uh, I apologize for not being able to appear in person. I had planned to and just uh, came down with a pretty pretty nasty illness this week, so I um, uh, just could not make it. Uh, so I'm glad I have this opportunity. Uh, my early work um, was about copyright, and that's how um, you know I got to know Corey and sort of got in this conversation early on. That was at the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century. More recently, I have published a book about Google in 2011 called The Googleization of Everything and Why We Should Worry. And just this year, I published a book called Anti-Social Media, How Facebook Disconnects Us and Undermines Democracy. So that's fun. Uh, great, and Corey, could you Remind our uh, non-in-the-room viewers who just tuned in about who you are, please. Sure. I'm Cory Doctorow, and I'm a science fiction novelist and uh, an activist uh, and a journalist. I, I work with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm one of the owners of the website Boing Boing, and I'm uh, at the MIT Media Lab as a research affiliate and at UNC as a practice, visiting professor of practice at the library school and at the Open University as a visiting professor of computer science. And um, my interest in this is both uh, professional and I guess you'd say ethical in that I, I've, I've had this long association uh, with trying to think through the, the uh, social dimension of technology, but also as a science fiction novelist, the, uh, the way that information dissemination and particularly copyright rules are structured has uh, an, uh, an enormous salience for me and, and really determines you know, the extent to which I can pay my mortgage. <laughs> Uh, Adrian? So um, I'm Adrian Johns. I'm one of the two organizers with Ada of this. Um, I'm in the history department here, and I also chair a little graduate program called Conceptual and Historical Studies of Science. Uh, I do the history of science, um, the history of printing and publishing, especially in what Europeans call the early modern period, so from, I don't know, 1450 to 1750. Um, and I, I wrote a big fat book called Piracy, which is about opposition to intellectual property from 200 years before intellectual property existed until about 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm Ada Palmer. I'm also here in the history department. I work on radical thought in the Renaissance, radical thought in the Enlightenment, somewhat on radical thought now. And I'm also a, a novelist like Corey, so have an interest in the workings of copyright and publishing and information movement today, uh, in addition to in a scholarly sense. Uh, so Will, I hope you could kick us off a little bit, because this morning we, you and I talked about some of your work on the earlier discussions of news and whether news could be owned in comparison with the foundation of copyright laws about the ownership of other kinds of information. And I wonder if you could kick in with a little bit of that, and then I'm sure Siva and Corey and others will have corollaries to talk about with it. Sure. Well, one of the things I worked on a book on the history of uh, attempts to control news, and copyright is only you know one mechanism that you might use to try to control uh, the, the flow of news. But what I found was that uh, actually the history of copyright for news publications is quite different, uh, follows a different trajectory than the history of copyright for uh, other kinds of works, including other kinds of informational works. And this has to do with changing attitudes towards what news is and, and how news functions. So from a very uh, early date, there are debates about whether or not you can have a kind of literary property in accounts of recent events. And there are a number of uh, kinds of opposition that developed to that um, in the early efforts to create a monopoly right in news. But one argument that develops is that News is somehow different than other kinds of authorship, that it's, it's not only fact-based, but it's supposed to be a kind of account of what happened, 
It's, it's not supposed to be creative or made up. It's not supposed to have too much imagination. So you see that actually when people are developing, uh, trying to develop a copyright for news, they, they, they lead, there are oppositions to it based on kind of aesthetic or um, cultural grounds. The other main argument that was often used against it was that uh, news needs to circulate because journalism is important to democracy and having knowledge about what's happened in the world is absolutely fundamental. And so anything that might restrict the circulation of that information uh, would be problematic. So in, in a way, um, you've got, that's the history of sort of the ideas for and against. And I've tried to recount that in my book, but also to think about how news publishers actually work. Uh, but I think I'll stop there so that people can well, I was hoping you could add a tiny nugget just because I'd love to hear uh, Siva and Corey's reactions to this. You talked about um, local papers that would then be transmitted sometimes with the aid of the post office to have their material reused in other cities. Right. If you could talk about that <clears throat> very briefly. I, I think the basic point there is that news publications have always existed in relation to other news publications that are situated in time and space. So if you think about a local newspaper um, generating content um, locally, uh, they might not have any uh, problem with a newspaper in another town uh, reproducing their information. And that in the, in, the, in the end, actually, this is how news spread for a long time uh, through the post and even later through the telegraph was that, you know, uh, information, not everybody can gather information from everywhere, so early forms of cooperation were basically exchanging news among publishers. And so that uh, what happens is that over time, based on the introduction of new technologies, but also new practices, new ways of publishing, new things like press agencies, or um, the invention of evening papers, which now compete with daily papers, the invention of weekly papers, which compete with, and, and so on. So, the, these boundaries, these, these, the, the, the time-space relationship among publishers is constantly being reformulated. And it's this larger kind of political economy of news that determines the extent to which copying might seem good or bad. In some cases, copying can seem very useful and can be justified as a way of spreading news and commentary. And in other cases, depending on the relationships among publishers, copying could seem like a threat. So that... Uh... You know, if early on a New York paper actually actively wants its news to be re-published uh, by a Houston area paper, and there's no subscription overlap between those two papers because they're both consumed locally, then both of those papers have a vested interest in making sure news isn't copyrighted so that that reproduced news can happen and so that that cooperation can happen, which is very contrary to the interests of a book publisher, for example who actively wants it to be limited. I think from, from reading Will's <laughs> work, I think that uh, one could put it actually stronger than that, if I remember right, that back in the, in the days immediately after the revolution, when a copyright act is passed, there's a, that's only one half of, as it were, a new uh, informational contract in, in the, the, the nascent United States. And the other half is the setting up of the post office. And yeah. one of the clauses, if I remember right, from the post office is that it's set up partly to facilitate exactly this. You build up a, a democratic republic by circulating information, by making it f essentially free for newspapers to send copies to other newspapers so that they can, they can copy it and the news can become a kind of shared resource on the basis of which a rational uh, sort of public democracy will emerge. I think that's, that's, that's absolutely right. I, I, would, I would pair the 1790 Copyright Act, which was the first U.S. statute of copyright was 1790. It explicitly protected books, charts, and maps. And the 1792 law setting up the post office, I would see those together. It wouldn't have made any sense to anybody at the time to put a copyright on newspapers, for example. What made this, the kind of subsidy that made sense to them to ensure that information would spread was a post, were postal regulations that it charged an extremely low rate for newspapers, making sure that they could spread to subscribers very easily. And then, as Adrian said, uh, actually making it entirely free for newspaper publishers to exchange their newspapers with each other. And why would they exchange their newspapers with each other? Well, to get the local news from other areas. And, and not just news. I mean, other things that, that appear in newspapers, 
like literary pieces, like uh, it lists of information and prices of commodities, like poems and other things. So th this was definitely a, treating sh news as a shared resource in this period, and one that could be repackaged locally and framed locally for a local audience, and the, the postal policy was clearly subsidizing that. So it's as though, you know, one often talks about, about intellectual property and copyright as forms of artificial scarcity. They create value by artificially creating scarcity of things. It's almost like at that, at that foundational moment, you have artificial scarcity, but you also have artificial plenty in a mm. certain way. The system is set up to, uh, to, 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 to override, as it were, what might be thought of as natural scarcity in the sense that these are quite large geographical distances that newspapers could be sent across. Um, if you artificially make that free, then it really is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal. And I mean, they, they, they explicitly talked about the fact that, you know, this was an experiment. Having a democratic, uh, democratically elected republic in an expanding geographic area, they really talked about, well, how do you get information across these vast distances? How do you make sure that people who are voting for state legislature or national governments have the kind of information that they need? And so postal policy and the way post, the post and the newspapers work together was, was part of that. I'd be... Uh, I'd be interested in, in hearing some views on um, the extent to which the power of newspaper proprietors paid into that debate as well. One thing that we're seeing in the EU where there's still uh, an, uh, a fair bit of power accruing to those proprietors, especially in Germany with these very powerful newspaper families, is that copyright policy is being made often in defiance of, of any kind of good sense but to the benefit of those proprietors. Uh, specifically, there's this new uh, Article 11 rule that's part of the new copyright directive that says that linking to the news will require a paid commercial license uh, if you use one word or more from the article in the text of the link, which would often include, you know, just the, the link itself will often have more than one word from the article in it. And um, the way that it's structured appears to also prohibit newspaper proprietors from waiving this right so that uh, if you have a Creative Commons news site or what have you, you, you're required to do this. And this seems pretty obviously structured to the benefit of a, of a narrow subset of news proprietors and, and specifically to like half a dozen very powerful German families who are dictating policy for 480 million, Euro million Europeans uh, to, to, to tilt the board in their favor and transfer a few million euros from uh, from Facebook and Google to themselves. Yeah. Well, s sadly, a lot of the French publishers are in favor of it too, and I'm not sure that they all understand exactly what will happen, because the information ecosystem is very complex, and, you know, despite the fact that this EU uh, Article 11 proposal has been there for over two years, we still don't have a single study that says it's actually going to generate a significant revenue. In fact, everything suggests otherwise. But there's a kind of, the, the rhetoric is all about protecting the press and about giving a fair share of the revenue, the advertising revenue that's captured by, by Google and Facebook and so on, giving a, some kind of way of returning some of that value to the news organizations that are so vital. But to return to, Corey, to return to your question, in the early period, um, the publishers did argue back and forth about the best policy for, for, for the Post and later for copyright. And the big publishers in New York, for example, uh, wanted a different kind of postal policy that would be, for example, a universal rate that would, be, it would cost the same amount to send a New York newspaper regardless of the distance. Smaller publishers in, in smaller towns and so on said, well, this is no good. You have to have graduated postage because if you have Otherwise, if you have an extremely low rate, then pub publishers emanating from New York and Philadelphia and Boston are going to control the entire um, news industry in the country. So every time postal policy came up, these kinds of questions of what would be the effects on democracy, what would be the effects on access to local information, what would be the effects on you know which publishers would get the most readership, and so on. And this this was often come up, and I think sadly with the EU uh, copyright directive, we're not getting enough discussion about that, about how it's going to affect the whole information ecosystem, how it's going to affect smaller publishers, smaller platforms, and so on. 
so I was I, I was thinking about taking the uh, the story in a slightly different way and moving it into our current set of dilemmas. Um, you know, one of the things that we can track over this similar period of time is that um, <clears throat> for the last few centuries, we've seen the price of production and distribution of printed material and thus, you know, let's talk about news, fall. At the same time, we've seen over the last few centuries, at least in Europe and North America, and then soon after in most of the world, uh, the uh, sort of ideological and commercial demand for knowledge and culture go up. So you have the price of production and distribution of material going down, the demand for material going up. These are two inter obviously interrelated phenomenon. One doesn't necessarily cause the other in some simplistic way. It's not the technology that drives literacy. It's not literacy that drives technology. We are all embedded. Our demands are embedded in our machines and our machines are embedded in our demands, etc. right? So that's, that's a long story. But the story also takes place at different paces. So at first, the story of the drop in prices of production and distribution and the increase in demand for stuff happens slowly. So you can watch it over two or three centuries, you know, steadily getting there. And then about the mid 19th century and well through the end of the 20th century, this acceleration gets bigger, right? So everything gets faster. The price is dropping faster. The distance that content can travel gets farther and, you know, the demand for this stuff gets more intense and it gets more interesting, more complex, right? So that's a long story. So you get that picture in your head. Then think about that last decade of the 20th century. And you can even trace it from like 1995 to 2005. In a really short period of time, much of the world goes from a condition or an assumption of scarcity, scarcity of expression, scarcity of knowledge to one of abundance. And abundance doesn't even quite capture the situation now, right? This, this idea that all of a sudden we are overwhelmed with a torrent of sounds and images and text demands on our attention. We are, we are, we are asked, in fact, tempted to put more and more interface devices and systems in front of our eyes for more and more time of the day. Each of these devices has uh, a more a bigger variety of influences, right? So th again, imagine this is our condition, right? So these two trends are happening slowly for several centuries. For about a century and a half, it really speeds up. And then in a 10-year period, everything flips. We, not long ago, lived in a quiet and dark world. Human beings fumbled around in the dark and didn't make a whole lot of noise. So the noise we made didn't travel very far. Now we live in a loud and bright world and one that we haven't quite adjusted our ears and our eyes and our minds to let alone adjusted our laws and norms and rhetorical practices. So one of the things I think about a lot when I think about the control of news or censorship of news or even issues like copyright is that the norms and laws and rhetorical support for what we generally call free speech or a free press are, you know, they're still anchored in the assumptions of that quiet world or of the quiet world that is about to become faster, louder, and brighter, at least there's some indication, right? So even we, you know, we invoke this, you know, this term, the enlightenment, right? So the enlightenment is about bringing light. So we've been desperately trying to hook up lights into our lives for several centuries. We've had massive uh, industries devoted to this practice, to this goal. We've, 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 um, we've put children through these institutions we call, call schools to push the idea of enlightenment. And it all makes sense and it all made sense, but we still view what we just went through 
in the same terms that John Stuart Mill wrote about, right? Where, where, where he's writing in a world of printed and bound books that only a handful of people on earth can encounter. Uh, and, and he's not necessarily thinking, and none of the people who thought about these issues in the 18th and 19th centuries could even start to imagine our information ecosystem, our media ecosystem, which is so radically different in just a short period of time. So what I've just outlined for you is something that I have been messing around with in my head just for the last few months. You know, so I, you know, I spent a couple of years uh, writing about Google and then I spent the last, you know, two years or so writing and talking about Facebook. And uh, as I said, that's on the tail end of thinking about a lot of the same issues about how copyright changed over several centuries in, in much of the world. And, and the, ex, the, the, the rapid acceleration, that flip that happened between 1995 and 2005 in various parts of the world still just boggles my mind, you know? And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've not gotten a hold of it. But, you know, the, but, but, but the real key to me now is that we are as far from living in a quiet and dark world as we could possibly imagine. And we have a different problem, right? The problem is not necessarily that people can't find ways to express themselves, can't find platforms, can't find audiences, or can't find a means, right? That was a problem to be solved for several centuries. We have a new problem, and it is a function of cacophony, right? This is, um, uh, you know, the, uh, th this, is a, this is a flip side problem. Right now, the problem we should be trying to manage is the fact that we have too much noise and too much light, and we find it almost impossible to think individually or collectively in these circumstances. It doesn't mean we can't figure it out, but if we're going to figure it out, I'm pretty sure we can't rely on the modes of thought that helped make the world brighter and louder. I think we might have to develop new ways of thinking through this problem. I think it's a problem we never really anticipated having. So you're making me very much newly regret that Anne Blair couldn't join us uh, for this series. Anne Blair, who works on the feeling of having too much information uh, in the late 16th century. And I think we'll talk about that in a second. But there was a student question in the corner. Yes, that is exactly how people felt in the Industrial Revolution, that suddenly there was a cacophony more, you know, many, many more papers are being produced. It's also how people feel in the second half of the 16th century when, right. as Anne Blair works on for the first time, uh, they, they feel there is too much to know. There, the perception sure. is more books are now being produced than you can read. You can't read all the books anymore. Up until uh, Manuel, now, yeah, you know, the system it, has it, it, been, to be right. a learned person, you read every book that comes out because it's not all I that mean, many. Immanuel Kant had the same anxieties, right? But, so it's it's one thing to feel it, and I think everybody in every age feels it. Once the acceleration starts, it's a phenomenon that's impossible to ignore because the whatever day you're thinking and writing about the situation is brighter and louder than the day before. So the very fact that we had that feeling only indicates the fact that there was... Uh, a curve of of loudness and brightness. I think we can empirically show <laughs> that it did in fact happen, right? And that it's not. It goes beyond a feeling. The feeling is constant because the motion is constant. The growth is constant. But the fact of the matter is, we live in a, a very different ecosystem now than we did even twenty years ago. Uh, and and it has complicated our ability to think collectively, if we ever were any good at that, which is another challenge. I, d I don't want to be so ahistorical as to think that we had mastered that project of thinking together. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, I mean, it's nice to meet you virtually, uh, Siva. <laughs> I've been a fan of your work for a while. And one of the things that reading your book, Anti-Social Media, made me think about is that you could see... Google and Facebook as tools, you know, that society relies on to try to manage all this 
information, right? And if you think about the parallels with the Renaissance and earlier periods where they had similar anxiety, even though the scale was arguably very different, you think about the tools that they developed that Anne Blair talked about, you know, title pages, indexes, yep. compilations, library catalogs, all sorts of tools that were developed in the first ages of print to try to manage yep. the information. And in, in, you know, in the 18th century, there were similar anxieties, but there were new forms of publication that were developed, like magazines and digests and, and, and ways of trying to kind of manually aggregate and manually deal with all this stuff. And if That's you think right. about Google and Facebook as one way of trying to sort of manage the flux of information, and then you, you read uh, Siva's work and you realize, well, but it's not a very good way of managing it, or, it's, or it creates all sorts of per, perverse effects. We've got to have yeah. some other way of, of dealing with all this abundance than simply, you know, living in filter bubbles. Absolutely. You should have written my book. Thank you. That, I, 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 I think you, you summed it up perfectly. Yeah, we, we've, you know, we've, um, we've bought into or, uh, or um, attentioned ourselves into, I don't know, attended ourselves into these two systems that filter our attention and structure our stimuli, not exclusively, but significantly. Uh, and, and in Google's case, I would argue almost necessarily, once we decided to have this thing called the World Wide Web as a major part of our lives, we needed a Google to help us manage it and the, and the question for me back in 2011 is, is Google the right kind of agent to do this management? My conclusion was we should have built alternatives, you know, just as librarians harnessed the cacophony of the print era rather effectively. We needed some sort of public human knowledge project to manage the growing cacophony of the digital era in a global sense, and that was an opportunity we were missing out on by relying on this private actor to make decisions in its own interest while it pretended to make decisions in our interest. So that was kind of my conclusion to that book. But at this point, I'm much more worried about the fact that we have an algorithmic, a system of algorithmic amplification that chooses for us the the, the material that sparks the strongest possible emotions among us. That has a very different effect than a simple Google search problem. So uh, I, 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 I wanted to relate this to a critical juncture in, in Google's history. When, when Google started, they referred to search algorithms as though they were discovering a mathematical truth about relevance. So people would go up to Google engineers and business development people and say, why isn't my web page about cats on the first page of the Google results for a search for cats? And Google would say, um, because it's not a good enough page. If you want your page to show up on the front, uh, on the first 10 results, make it a better page about cats because we've written math that figures out what the best cat pages are. And this was like, it was really socially useful for them because it spared them a lot of like genuinely awkward cocktail party conversations where you would have to explain to someone that like you didn't like them uh, and that's why their page wasn't in the top 10 results, right? That you just thought that they were doing things badly and, and you would instead say like the math doesn't lie. And then what happened was that governments woke up one day and started to say, if this is math, it's not speech. The, the top 10 results, if they have extremist content, copyright infringement, pornography, or any other class of speech that we believe we have an interest in regulating, we can do so without implicating free speech interests because it's as though you had rolled a dice that was weighted to decide where the, where the result would fall. You didn't make an editorial choice to do this. And it had been really obvious to anyone who paid attention prior to that moment 
that although the programmer might not decide, oh, this page goes first, this page goes second, the programmer, when they write an algorithm that ranks this page first and this page second and this page third, is making an aesthetic editorial judgment. The programmer looks at the results and goes, that looks right to me. And so this is an aesthetic editorial choice that has this strong speech interest. Google itself deliberately undertook a project to change it. Like they got Eugene Volokh, who's a First Amendment scholar, to write essays, law review papers, about how this is not math, it's a, a subjective uh, speech-interested judgment, and therefore governments should stop telling Google how to order their search results. That, that this was like a tactical thing they deployed as an anti-regulatory measure. measure. Uh, in, in case people are interested, there's a, there's a scholar at um, Harvard, Alex Cesar, which is spelt C-S-I-S-Z-A-R, who's been working on the history of things like peer review systems in the sciences. And you can f he's found evidence of at least concerned counter strategies by journal editors going back through really the 1960s uh, because they were worried that uh, institutions, scientific research institutions, scientific researchers would, as it were, game the system about um, citation indices in, in a similar way to this that, that is now happening to, to Google. So citation indices start out, and it, it, quite quickly, in fact, it turns out that, um, that, that if you ever had a vision of them as being, as it were, an objective measure of scientific influence or quality, that's qualified and undermined and shifted by, by uh, uh, forces that realize how they work and are able to sort of manipulate them and get, get a higher uh, citation index than they otherwise would have. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in two overlapping uh, issues that Siva's comments touched on here. One is the reality of being in a period of exponential growth of information, being in a period of the exponential increase in how quickly information moves and how much of it we have access to. You know, I would say that that begins at the point of print or possibly a couple decades before print when there was a big push in increasing the pace at which manuscripts were being produced in Europe and that from then till now, Every decade, you are having an, an exponential increase in the speed in which information moves, uh, and it's continuing to increase, and the increase is, as, as he says, getting faster. You know, I sometimes like to refer to the era from the printing press uh, through now as the exponential age, uh, be defined in part by the fact that information is moving exponentially faster, so that not, e not only each generation, but each person living as a generation experiences the movement of information being consciously faster in the second half of your life than in the first. But the reality of living in an exponential age is not identical with the consciousness of feeling that you're living in an exponential age. The fact that information is moving in new ways being something that you're aware of and that you think about a lot. So for example, I can certainly remember when I was younger, you know, coming home from school and my parents would watch the news on television and there was only one the news because we only got one channel. And later we had three channels and then my parents would discuss which of the three versions of the news to watch on television. And, you know, to me, ooh, that was, that was a change. But I didn't think very consciously about the fact that that's a significant and world-shifting change. But I think right now, even, you know, middle schoolers coming home from school are very conscious of the fact that social media is changing information, that uh, search engines are changing information. This is a saturate conversation and a self-identity issue of what, how we feel about our own era. One of its defining characteristics is that it is in a state of exponential informational growth, which is not only represented by the fact that this middle schooler has already seen the news through Twitter and Facebook and social media through the interstices between classes even while at school because news is inescapable, but also just because there are conversations about that very fact very ubiquitously. And there have been, I think, no periods since the printing press that haven't seen exponential increase in the speed with which information moved, partly because the printing press itself took time 
to disseminate, and it itself disseminates exponentially. You know, at first Gutenberg has a press, and he has one press, and then he teaches the people to make presses, and they have four presses, and they teach people to make presses, and they have eight presses, and it's like the puzzle where you have a penny on the first square of a chessboard, and then you have two, and then you have four, and then you have eight. And by the time you get to the far end of the chessboard, you have trillions of dollars. But by the time you're a third of the way across the chessboard, there have been a bunch of exponential increases, but it isn't at saturation yet. And you can look at the dissemination of the printing press in that exponential space. It's invented in 1450, but it increases increasing degrees of saturation steadily over the next several hundred years, each of which trigger ma major revolutions. So for example, it's around 1700, the dawn of the Enlightenment, when there are finally enough printing presses and a large enough buying public of books that authors for the first time start seriously living on book sales instead of living on dedicating the book to the Duke of such and such and getting a bag of gold, being the primary business model for being an author. And you see lots of changes in what gets written, how it gets published, triggered largely by there being one order of magnitude more printing presses than there had been a half generation earlier, even though no new specific technology was developed, but new ways to aggregate, new ways to share information, new ways to digest the news from uh, daily into weekly into monthly saturation, you know, all of these things increased and shifted how much information was there. But so all of these decades, all of these generations experienced this exponential growth, but there were particular moments that you saw people talk about it more. This, the late 16th century, people are really talking about it. Uh, the very late 15th century, when printing is brand new, people are really talking about it. Now we're really talking about it. It was certainly happening when I was younger, but we weren't talking about it quite at the same level. And I think that that distinction is it exponential and are you conscious of the fact that it's exponential is an important factor. So what do you think the, what do you think the factors are that bring the phenomenon to public consciousness? If that's even a 16th century idea of public consciousness, but let's just say something people talk and write and feel about, like what are the conditions? Why does it happen at some moments and not others? Big question. Adrian, do you want to? Well, the, or you could when, disagree and say you think that it doesn't not happen in some. I guess I, 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 um, I mean, an obvious one is just, you know, uh, advents of, of technological changes. I mean, you know, um, we could go through it. Obviously, I mean, the, the invention of printing, uh, the the development of steam presses in the early to mid nineteenth century. Um, you know, radio broadcasting, TV broadcasting in the 20th century, internet, you know, these, these... Telegraph. Telegraph in the 19th century. Uh, these, these things uh, both actually do increase the speed with which you can transfer at least small bits of information back and forwards in the case of the telegraph. Um, and they focus people's minds. The other thing that they do, I think, just to, this is another bell that was ringing in my mind, is that... Um, they also repeatedly have had this weird effect of focusing attention inwards on almost something like subjectivity or psychology, because with each one, there's, there's, there's a rich set of, I hesitate to call them metaphors, because I don't like the term metaphor. I think it's too sort of weak. But uh, they're, all, they're metaphors, figurations, where, where one decides that the very practice of thinking itself is like a telegraph. You know, in the 19th century, there's a very rich literature of, of people saying that thinking is, you know, the nervous system of the human body is basically an internal telegraphy system. Hmm. Um, the same thing happens with telephony in the, in the late 19th century. Um, in the, in the uh, mid-20th century, it's decided that memory is basically like a tape recorder. And then, it, then it becomes like a video recorder. Um, and there's a moment when if you have startling memories, those are called flashbulb memories because they're what happens when you set off a flash, like a Polaroid. Right. Now, now it's an Instagram story. My memory is an Instagram story. And so there's something where I, th I think one of the, so I guess one of the things, I'm, the reason why I say this is I think that, that if one focuses attention on the story of exponential increase, there's a kind of risk that one tacitly assumes that, as it were, the, the human subject remains the same through this, and that's like the common calibration point. Mm. The, act of the, the act of reading, say, is the ca common calibration point. And I don't think it's quite clear that that's so, because at each juncture, 
these exponential increases have led people in some ways to reconceive what the very act of, of uh, confronting and, and uh, appropriating and taking in information is, what it is to read or view or listen, arguably actually, actually itself changes uh, because we think that what it is is different because we live in a, in a differently saturated media world. Will? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, certainly moments of very visible technological change bring out a lot of this discussion, but you can also take periods like the 18th century where there was no technological improvement in the way printing worked or anything like that, but there were massive changes in the number and kinds of publications that were produced. And so in the 18th century, you find a lot of discussions of a mania or a kind of uh, obsession with reading and you find uh, anxieties about the kinds of reading that people are doing. And so there's a German scholar named Rolf Engelsen who's talked about the reading revolution in, eight, in the 18th century. And he said that there was a general shift from intensive reading of one or a few texts, and usually these were the Bible and, and prayer books, to extensive reading of a, a very wide range of material. Scholars have since you know, called into question this and said, well, actually the same reader can read the Bible or a novel very intensively and then read the newspaper and pamphlets in a, in a much more of a skimming way. And clearly, any individual reader could have multiple strategies. But the very fact that there's this discussion and this anxiety about the proliferation of texts and the kind of you know, uh, lack of control over it is, in that case, not a technological change at all, but simply uh, the invention of new forms of publication and the proliferation of all sorts of periodicals that a kind of get a kind of ephemeral, have a kind of ephemeralality attached to them. And people sort of worry about that there's sort of too much to manage, but also that there's just kind of something frivolous and not as serious about it. And it creates faction, it creates, you know, um, uh, controversy between religious or political parties that are playing out in these periodicals and so on. So sometimes it's not technology and it's, it's actually the larger you know, kind of economy of, of media at the time. Yeah, or if it is a technology, it isn't a technology like printing press or telegraph, it's a mm. technology like footnote, like index, mm. like compilation, like magazine compiling the week's uh, reviews, that uh, a technological uh, innovation of how to organize and how to think about information, which then changes what reading means and how reading is viewed in the culture. I remember one point sitting with a couple of other press historians and thinking, we can date Disney's Beauty and the Beast to probably within a decade of the year 1600 because the poor provincial town has a bookshop, but nobody in the town thinks of it as a political act for Bell to be reading. So it has to have enough printing presses for a small town to have a bookshop, but Voltaire's letters on England haven't come out yet. And that's a pretty tight window. Now this is of course an imaginary space, but you know, thinking about the fact that the act of reading might mean a different thing in a different decade from what it meant earlier. So I, I want to propose a, a, a way to square the circle maybe, which is that um, the, the quote unquote normal order of an exponentially growing communications technology is that at its inception, you can consume all of it. So when the first bulletin board systems appear, you dial your local bulletin board system, and you read every message everyone in your city with a computer and a modem wants to transmit. And then as the growth occurs, you have to shift from a, um, uh, a deterministic exhaustive model to a selective model where you choose a few forums or bulletin board systems you're going to dial into. And then exponential growth outstrips that and you have to move to a probabilistic model where you just skim all of it. You dip into it like it was a river and you count on signal amplification of significant things for people to retweet or retumble or repost or argue uh, about the things that are important enough so that wherever you dip into the river, you are statistically likely to find the important news of the moment. And that the model is very uncomfortable at each of these phase transitions, but comfortable once you've accomplished them. And if there's not enough refractory time 
between those that that each of those comfort moments and the emergence of a new technology there's just never any moment in which you feel comfortable so it's not that people of antiquity were not struggling with information overload because everybody had made up an epic poem and wanted them to listen to it it was that there was enough time between the manias that they could you could normalize them and we can't normalize them anymore there's a there's a sorry, just to say that there was a question there but there's a there's an interesting linguistic sort of practical uh indicator of this to some extent that um, so in the early years of printing there was an aspiration to create a universal library the french historian Roger chartier has pointed pointed to this there's an aspiration to create a universal library which in the first thoughts of it would be an actual building which would hold all the books and that dream doesn't quite go away it's there in bourguer's later and so forth but quite quickly it becomes clear that you couldn't actually build a building that's going to create all the books because there are more books being produced so fast that you know you'd have to expanded that would fill the whole planet. So then the Universal Library becomes a book. So it's a bibliography uh, produced actually by Gesner, who is a, a zoologist in, this, in Switzerland. Um, and it attempts to just list all of the books. And then you, you, know, you could look up in the list and then you could go off and find the book. That, after about two supplements, it becomes clear that the Universal Library can't be a book. And what it then becomes is a periodical, a journal. So it becomes essentially one of the first review journals, uh, Bibliothèque Universelle, and it goes on. So the idea is that the, the Universal Library is intrinsically open-ended. And, uh, and then, you, then, then it kind of dissolves completely in the 18th century, and you start getting these things like, almost like libraries of libraries. But that's, that, that's an interesting transition from building to book to periodical. So the question is how the Cold War, with two factions strongly trying to restrict information and keep it out of the hands of the other, affected the public consciousness of the simultaneously exponentially increasing amount of information? Wow, that's a really good question. I think it's the sort of question that could generate a nice PhD thesis, in fact, um, because it, it tracks along with um, a really interesting set of debates in the 1960s and 70s about the uh, sincerity of the virtues of the free flow of information, the notion of whether the free flow of information is in fact um, a mask for uh, northern and western imperialistic media companies, the Disneys of the world, the Dow Jones of the world, um, and whether in fact the free flow of information would overwhelm the developing world uh, with a um, uh, set of images that are irresistible to the public and thus would crowd out any sort of indigenous knowledge or, uh, or local concerns or local literature or local film. Um, and, you know, media policy in the 1970s across most of the world reflects these anxieties. So there's a sense in the parts of the world that are not under Soviet control and yet not, um, you know, signed up to the, the explicit mission of the United States. Uh, and that, by the way, that would include France and Canada. Uh, you know, they're, 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 they're developed a, a set of resistive policies to the, you know, to the principle of free flow a radical free flow so that, uh, the, you know, every Canadian radio station would play X number of Canadian artists per hour so that it would not all be, you know, American and, and British artists on, on pop music in Canada. And uh, in France, there would be X number of films uh, on any in any city at any given time, X number of screens in any city at any time playing French and or European um uh, funded films so that, you know, Disney and Woody Allen would not overwhelm every screen uh, through the, the, the power, the, the commercial power of the producers, uh, and not to mention that sort of cultural attractiveness in some ways, right, of the, of the sort of made for the world films. Um, so, so it's a really fascinating set of debates that goes on in the Cold War about this concept of free flow and the, and the real concern that, 
um, U.S. imperialism will come dressed as Mickey Mouse uh, rather than as 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 you know MacArthur or Patton, um, and uh, you know it, it's um, th- that that theme that sense of concern um, remains a bit vestigial after 1995 after the notion that. Uh, you know, digital networks might actually change the whole formula because the the assumption about the digitization of cultural production is that it will open up more voices and more channels, and there might be something closer to a level playing field. Uh, of course, we found that not to be true in the least. Um, we found a very weird playing field um, than what we had before, a completely different playing field. Uh, but I think that that's, I mean, that's a fascinating question. The role of the Soviet uh, Union in these debates is something that's uh, almost a little bit too simple, I think, in my own mind, and deserves deeper examination than than anything I'm prepared to talk about at this point. I think on that, another factor is that the the, the amount of censorship and control of information and oppression that was going on in the USSR was vast and historically unprecedented and enormous. But that also allows the opponents of that system to propagandistically self-identify as the free world, right? And, and as the world where there must be free information flowing and where there isn't restriction, which builds up a lot of America's own self-identity as the country without censorship, which is in no way true and was in no way true then, but is nonetheless sort of how America gets us to imagine it uh, in its own self-presentation. I think to a degree that is greater during and after the Cold War even than before in terms of how much America felt that its freedom of speech was a part of its signature identity and something that it wanted to spread with the rest of the world by making the world free through the dissemination of information. That, That leads me, and I know we had another question in a moment, but I'd love to hear others weigh in on the question of geography a bit more directly because we have at several different points in this touched on how the way movement of information and especially in particular the movement of news but also this cultural stuff uh, is affected by local communities and then gradually the isolation of the local becoming less and less over time. So that if early on it was a great boon to all of these newspapers to be able to let other newspapers freely copy their news in another city so that they can do the same because there was no competition in their market because they're all selling primarily locally. That's certainly not true of news right now where news is consumed on a vast national or or in many ways language block format where something that's put out in English language news is going to be consumed and consumable in most of the English language speaking world, same for the French material in the francophone world, same for Portuguese material in the Portuguese speaking world, making us have geography change its meaning. So the geography still matters because what laws affect you, what government changes affect you, what language you're speaking, what local artists you are trying to communicate with are still strongly affected by geography. And we still have policies like what Siva was talking about in the Cold War where you know, Italy legislates that only X percentage of movie theaters may screen English language films. Other movie theaters, the vast majority of movie theaters must screen films in Italian. They may be foreign films, but they must be dubbed into Italian to preserve the Italian language. You know, we see this kind of geographically based concern. But newspapers today cannot function the way the newspapers that Will was looking at functioned because their market is so different. Or Perhaps they can a little bit. So could we hear a little more about geography, thoughts on geography? Well, I think there's another missing piece here, which I'll, I will come back to geography, but uh, it's related to that. And that's how you fund this production of news. Um, so historically, advertising was so important in the funding of the newspaper, whether it was the local newspaper or a more regionally distributed newspaper or a more nationally distributed newspaper, advertising uh, became increasingly important. You can see it already in the 18th century uh, that it was the majority of profits of newspapers. And by, I think it it peaked around 2000 at 80% of the revenue of United States newspapers was advertising. 
And since uh, 2000, it has plummeted. And you can actually, it's actually started declining in around 1980 or so, the total uh, amount of advertising money. But what happened then is that not only can you access news from any point in the world, you know, based on your linguistic skills, but the whole, ad, the whole local advertising market drops out. So that, you know, now you have to look for how to fund this, this news. So, it, you know, it started with early things like Craigslist, which made it possible for you to find a house to rent or a bike to buy or whatever by going online. That, that immediately affected newspapers' ability to run the classified ads. It used to be that's where you'd, you'd go to look for a job or a bicycle or whatever would be in the newspaper. And, you know, and then the general sort of, uh, you know, buying cars and watches and all of that, too. So the, the shift of, of advertising uh, online and the, the way in which uh, the local newspaper has been unable to control that revenue stream is, is absolutely massive uh, and is, is, you know, it explains why, you know, things like uh, struggling to have some kind of new intellectual property for news or have any other way to to increase funding is is on the minds of publishers. Yeah, and I, I would say that that is a problem that changing copyright does not solve, right? Changing copyright might shift, I think we've, we've gone through this a bit, right? You know, might shift the visibility of articles in certain frames marginally, but it doesn't move the money in the way that actually regulating the advertising industry might, right? Or, or regulating the, as, as Europe has been, and I think in some successful experiments, regulating the ways in which data is collected and you, data are collected and used for the placement and targeting of advertisements, right? It's the data that makes Facebook and Google better at doing advertising than any media form ever created by anybody anywhere. It's the data collection that makes Facebook and Google superior to and less expensive than purchasing an ad through the Wall Street Journal, purchasing an ad through The Guardian, purchasing an ad through Le Monde. You know, those things are not as effective from an advertiser's point of view than purchasing a, you know, betting on a keyword on Google search or, or purchasing a set of interests as a targeted audience on Facebook. This has resulted in a massive flow of advertising money away from all of the different forms of content that have long depended on advertising, magazines, newspapers, television, and radio to these, to this, you know, the, these two companies, Facebook and Google, uh, and at the same time, in order to demand, in order to summon the audience that one needs to even survive, a publisher must pander to the algorithmic demands of Facebook and Google. So there's a constant anxiety. Are we reading Facebook and Google properly so that our content shows up in front of people's eyes at the right moments? And uh, therefore, what must we do to make ourselves more attractive to Facebook and Google's algorithms? At the same time, Facebook and Google are taking away all the advertising they would have earned anyway. So it's like these publications are constantly making design and editorial decisions to feed the very beasts that are starving them. Uh, and it's a really vicious cycle, one that that no one has yet come up with a bold enough response to. Uh, I think it's a pretty serious emergency, and all we have seen so far are some fairly weak and marginal responses, like this copyright change in Europe, which is at best useless, at most harmful. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I think it's, I mean, one, one, one way to look at the, the Article 11 and Article 13 is to is to see the way the rhetoric is all crystallized around a kind of, um, Amer you know, a fear of a kind of American control of media. So, so much of it is, 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 you know, reminding me of your question. So much of it is about, you know, we've got these big American technology firms that increasingly shape the information and the content and how we experience it. And we need to find some way. We've now, you know, Europe is now trying with, is tried with privacy and now they're gonna try 
another way with copyright. The real thing that's, you know, the elephant in the room is uh, fiscal policy. It's, it's actually, you know, taxing their corporate profits, which might be a way of then redistributing that as a subsidy mm -hmm. for uh, artistic creation in Europe. But, you know, fiscal policy is hard to debate. Uh, it's hard to deal with on the, on the European wide level because each state is sovereign and so on. But clearly, it, there is, it's something about this advertising revenue that you know, needs to be the focus of you know, figuring out how you could potentially harness some of that to, to redistribute. But copyright, I agree, it's not going to do it. Yeah, I, I want to um, jump in with a few notes on, on newspaper history and then this, this uh, post-war era in which different countries had anxiety about particularly American media crushing them. So Clay Shirky has written a bit about the, the, the so-called golden age of the newspaper uh, after the, the uh, partisan era when you had this idea of nonpartisan local news. And he says that it was a, a function of, the, um, of this patrician newspaper proprietor who would own the local paper and feel some civic duty. And the paper's customers were primarily people who wanted to find out about sports scores. And the paper's advertisers were primarily people who wanted to sell white goods. And the news was a kind of, uh, it was like a civic duty that was that was peeled off from the profits of selling white, white goods to sports fans uh, in order to uh, send someone down to City Hall. And that this was, this was how, this was the quid pro quo of being a great family in the town and publishing the town's newspaper. And, and that's really kind of what's broken. And when you think about it, it's actually a fairly recondite and weird way for us to have run this essential democratic institution. Uh, and it's it's kind of strange that it lasted as long as it did. Now, in Canada, there has been, as you heard, this this Canadian content rule, and not just for TV, but for magazines and so on. Um, this was, in fact, a very sharply debated rule in the most recent renegotiation of NAFTA that just concluded a few weeks ago. Um, and in one of the things that Canadian publishers have historically been really worried about is what was called the split run, which was when a magazine like uh, Sports Illustrated would pay reporters in America to generate news, uh, and they would re recoup the costs of all of that uh, reportage in America, and then they would come to Canada and they would reprint the magazine, but they would approach Canadian advertisers and offer them rates that reflected the fact that they'd already paid for all of the variable costs associated with the production, except the printing. All the reporting had already been paid for. And so they could undersell Canadian competitors. And this split run where the advertising was separated from the reportage was at the heart of multiple rounds of trade negotiations, including the first NAFTA and the current NAFTA uh, between the U.S. and Canada, because it is such a powerful thing in advertising-driven media to separate the production of the content from the uh, targeting of the advertising. Fascinating. That's a good, so about geography, there's a couple of other things that I'd raise. This is completely different from the issue about advertising. So um, one is that, um, I don't know this for a fact, Will will know this. So my sense is that if you think back sort of 50 years, at least in the UK, to a, to a more heroic age of, of uh, <laughs> newspaper journalism. Uh, major, major British newspapers like The Guardian, The Times, The Telegraph had correspondents who were placed in other parts of the world and they lived there for long periods. And so the reporting that you got back was, you know, sort of informed by an awareness of the local culture. Um, the Telegraph still does that, and The Guardian still does it to some extent. Uh, the Times I don't know because it's behind a paywall, so I haven't looked at it for like a decade. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, je but often I think that that culture of sort of rather Edwardian world of, of correspondence has dissolved. And in place of it, what we have is something that is portrayed as being like crowdsourcing. So when events happen... Um, what you get is either that the, well, actually both, that the, the, the newspaper flies somebody in and they land, they parachute into somewhere, they report on, as it were, the, the surface developments, and then they're airlifted out again and they go back to London or New York. And, it, and that's supplemented by 
as essentially the, a request that local citizens send stuff in by, by Twitter or, or cell phones or whatever. And it's explicit on the BBC's news website where if something happens like an earthquake, at the foot of the report, there will be a thing. Are you there? Can you please send us a paragraph? Um, and I, that, uh, there's, I think there are very complicated things to do with ethics and um, credibility, uh, responsibility for stories being, being accurate or not that come with that shift. Um, and as I say, I don't know to what degree it's, a, it's, it's real. My, my subjective experience is that it feels real to me that something like that has gone on. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's very much a geographical thing. So, you know, the, the Telegraph or something will certainly have its reporters in, in Westminster, but it won't necessarily have reporters now in New Delhi or Port Moresby or somewhere. Um, the other thing is that, if, since this is partly about censorship, it's worth remembering that if the information networks are transnational, they're still geographical, but they're not bounded by national boundaries, policing is jurisdictional, typically. So the, the police may have enormous powers within one jurisdiction, but they then hit a big problem if, say, you know, the, 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 the pirate TV signal is rooted through some other jurisdictional place, a different country or something. Um, and it's actually hit a different level. A, a few years back, I found myself talking to a, a police person from Hong Kong who'd been engaged with policing pirate TV, which is why that example comes to mind. And he made the point that it's no longer the case even that the digital files that they're trying to police are definitively in some other country. They're in no country. They're, they're sort of split up in different, different uh, sectors that are in different different jurisdictions completely. So there's no, it's not like he can go to the, 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 the his, co his corresponding person in, um, in the Philippines, say, and say, can you, can you go and raid this plant? Because there is no such place. You have to, you, you, you find yourself having to deal with something that is simply incommensurable with the world of jurisdictional policing. Sure. I mean, uh, absolutely. The uh, the foreign foreign reporting is one of the first things to go. It's extremely expensive, and in the in the reduction of staffs of even these successful newspapers, that is certainly one of the things that we're we're seeing less sustained, you know, use of foreign co correspondents, people who are there on the ground. And some of the big papers can still afford it, and it's a prestige thing, and they keep it. But uh, it certainly was something that in the older model that uh, you know is kind of a strange model, but was a model in which the sports scores and people's interest in sports paid for the foreign reporting. Um, on, the, on the border thing, I mean, there's just even everyday banal examples of that. In France, for example, you're not allowed to, journalists are not allowed to report uh, estimates of um, you know, exit polls during elections. And even the, um, the broadcasters have to wait until precisely 8 p.m to announce any kind of estimate of, of the day's vote. But if you're a journalist based in Belgium or in London and you have people on the ground and you know, so you get, you know, it's almost a kind of uh, pirate radio thing where people are tuning in to other sources on other sides of borders, but in the same language and able to, you know, sort of, so yeah, the state can't police that as, as easily as, as they might like to. So there were two separate questions. I'm going to repeat them, and then we're going to have our break, because it is break time, and I believe the coffee is outside, and then we can talk about them afterward. The second was a question about the difference between elite news consumption and non-elite news consumption, which is certainly something I work on a lot in the Renaissance, where we think of printed materials as being only for elites. And so the consumption of literature by illiterate audiences is a really fascinating field in which news is a central factor. So elite versus non-elite news consumption. And then other ways of dividing up news into different categories and the three proposed categories though we can play around with others were uh, news that is sustained by generating advertising revenue uh, and that is written in order to appeal to the people who will make advertising revenue uh, cost effective versus news that is produced uh, and marketed in order to advance a particular agenda so that the, the particular paper, let's say, you know, a, 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 a communist youth organization paper may be much more concerned about spreading its message than it is about advertising revenue and maybe getting all of its revenue from people donating to a cause. Uh, that is another revenue stream. Uh, 
And then the third being subscription revenue streams for people who are willing to pay for a particular thing, which in particular sustains specialist uh, publications such as the example given was trade journals. I would use the example of Locus Magazine, the trade journal of the science fiction world, where if you desperately want to have tedious black and white pages which meticulously list exactly what has been licensed by every science fiction and fantasy publisher in that month even though they won't be out for three years. Uh, you, you pay money for this magazine, but very few people in this room will pay money for this magazine, but nonetheless it's a sustainable model because of the subscription system. So subscription versus advertising versus uh, sort of uh, uh, support through the cause itself for something that supports a cause. So let's talk about that and also elite and non-elite news consumption and other things when we come back after our break. Thank you. Uh, all right, welcome back all. Uh, we have several speakers who are going to be filtering out at different points over the course of the next uh, hour as we wrap up. So we're gonna let Siva take first crack at our, um, at our questions residue from first half, one of which was about elite versus non-elite consumption of news and the other was about different ways that news has been uh, monetized or funded. Right, okay, yeah. I mean, different models for uh, political, of political economy for news. I, I mean, I think the only responsible response is a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, we, uh, I think we're gonna have successful advertising-based or advertising funded news organizations for at least a few more decades. They won't be prolific. They won't be anything close to universal. Um, but you know, there, there will be a handful like NBC still pays for itself through Ford trucks and Coca-Cola and Budweiser and Procter and Gamble. And that's unlikely to change very soon. Soon the, the, the bottom is not going to fall out of that. Uh, at the same time, the New York Times finds that harder and harder to do uh, every month. And so it is steadily shifting its sources of revenues to more subscription-based um, uh, uh, practices, you know, um, uh, you know, people signing up for conferences or for elite levels of membership or uh, you know, paying for full web access, um, having tiered membership. So that's, you know, those are two different models right there. Then there's the ProPublica or Texas Tribune experiment of uh, having memberships and philanthropic organizations, foundations support uh, the effort along the way. They run big conferences that bring in a lot of money from sponsors. Uh, and that way they're not fully dependent on the whims of advertising, you know, and uh, then there's just going to be a big shakeout. So there are going to be a lot of journalistic organizations that just won't exist. Those are likely to be the local uh, and the niche, um, although some niches have enough buying power behind them that they could... Uh, you know, they, they could start charging quite a bit. But the thing is, none of this is particularly profound or controversial. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, uh, uh, everybody try everything and then see what works. But uh, I don't see a long-term prospect for advertising. What that means, of course, is a concentration of primary access to those who can afford to pay for the publication, um, you know, that, that brings us back to a sort of, you know, pre penny press, um, you know, potential readership. So, you know, where, where more of the better journalism comes from the wall street journals of the world. What I haven't mentioned is of course, things like state support or political party support, which are also pre, well, at least political party support, those are pre-penny press models. Um, I think that's underexplored. Uh, I mean, we certainly see massive subsidies in France, um, you know, and, and we see, uh, you know, revival of, of party-based media in some ugly, rather ugly forms in certain parts of the world. 
Um, you know, but the thing we're not going to have is this weird blip in history uh, that we had since 1945, like basically 1945 to 2005, when we were able to have uh, a professionalized news uh, uh, flow that uh, had global reach and ran a surplus um, and and we could pretend that we were actually paying for the Moscow Bureau rather than the coverage of the White Sox game. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're probably going to have to step down from what was a very unusual time of heavily funded professionalized journalism in a global sense you know i think i think we had a we had an interesting run with that um but i think we're reverse reverting to the mean at this point do any of our historians want to weigh in on uh feeling sure. the exceptionalism of that period or not sure um yeah i think it's it, it is true that it's increasingly evident that uh this advertising funded bundled product of the newspaper where sports cross subsidizes foreign reporting has is is problematic now and i think it's time to it's time for us to think about what journalism is and what its role is and to start thinking about possibilities that have been anathema for a long time um, you know in this country there's a, a tradition of you know avoiding the discussion of state funding because somehow uh, state-funded journalism would be, you know, somehow in contradiction with the First Amendment, or it would somehow, the, the state could not be trusted to police itself, and so on. So that's unlikely. We're unlikely to have kind of state-funded state, state -funded journalism. But there are other areas where, in fact, there are, you know, in, in history, you can look at all the subsidies from the, that went to newspapers in the earlier period that I've studied, like the post office subsidy. And in Britain, of course, you have the tradition of the BBC. So we, we can't ignore that possibility. But one thing we were talking about this morning is, you know, think about the university. Think about the university as a model for a place that is, you know, it can be a fabulously rich institution built on private money, but also depends on a lot of, you know, uh, tax exemptions and the things that go along with having a nonprofit status and access to federal funds and so on. And the university, one of the functions that it has is to support the kinds of research that would not have funding on the private market. So we could, if we really valued journalism, see uh, you know, the university as one place where we could have journalism departments not just to train future journalists, but to actually produce journalism. Because you know, if, if, if the university can pay chemists or anthropologists or so on to do research, um, they could also pay uh, for journalism. So you do, you do see some, there are some examples of that. I mean, there are journalism schools that produce journalism. There's the Pointer Institute that has a relationship with, I think it's the Tampa Bay Times. Um, and you have examples of this. Another one that, that Siva mentioned is foundations. And, you know, we could think about, you know, big benefactors, the, you know, sort of the Jeff Bezos's of the world, you know, saving newspapers. But I think that's not a sustainable uh, you know, answer to the question either. It may help in the short term and so on, but there may be other kinds of foundations that could be set up. There's a, um, that could have more wider participation. There's a French scholar economist named Julia Caget who's written a book um, in French. It's, I would translate it sort of saving the media or saving journalism. And she pro proposes, you know, different kinds of funding structures. And one of them is, is, is a kind of foundation structure where there would be crowdfunding participation, but not just I'm going to give donations like I occasionally do to Wikipedia, but by giving donations, I'm also going to be have a voting right in this organization. And that you could actually, you, she has, she's an economist, so she talks about the different ways that you could set this up so that the largest donors don't automatically have the most control as they would in a shareholding corporation. But it would be a kind of not-for-profit, not-for-profit foundation that would be funded with, through a larger participation and could have a, a kind of a way to perpetuate itself and not be interested in, in you know, generating dividends for shareholders. And I would point out there's a, there's a Dutch news site called De Correspondent that uses that exact model. Uh, and it, it, might, it seems to be 
quite successful. There's a lot of energy behind it right now. So we'll see how it turns out in the long term. I'm really glad you brought up the idea of universities sponsoring, making, fostering journalism. Uh, I run a center at the University of Virginia called the Center for Media and Citizenship. And it has two purposes. One is to do that very thing, to sponsor journalism in the best possible way. So we are about to launch um, a, a, a statewide student-run uh, state news service uh, deploying student journalists at all of the public universities in Virginia to do the local reporting that contributes to a weekly magazine that will run on the public television stations here in Virginia. So again, commercial-free, subsidized entirely by these universities, but lightly subsidized, right? Um, and I also run a magazine called the Virginia Quarterly Review, run out of my center. It is, you know, heavily subsidized by the university, uh, although it makes subscription revenue on top of that. It does not sell any ads, uh, and uh, it's quite successful. It runs in the black every year, uh, wins national magazine awards regularly, competes for writers and readers with the likes of the New Yorker and National Geographic. Um, and it has, you know, Pulitzer Prize winners contributing to it regularly. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that can happen and should happen more. But we should start perhaps looking at that model on a local basis so that given the fact that there are college towns all around America uh, in, 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 in places that are losing their local news outlets, colleges and universities can pick up the slack in a lot of those ways. And that's just in this country. I would also say that, um, you know, we, the other thing my center does is it flips the challenge instead of asking like a journalism school would, how do we save journalism as, as it has been practiced and funded for a hundred years or 200 years? Uh, we ask what do citizens need to operate in an informed and responsible way going forward? What sort of uh, norms and regulations and platforms and technologies, uh, habits of mind and sources of information do citizens need to engage? That's a question that James Madison and Thomas Jefferson would have asked rather than asking how to save or how to build a business model. The the idea of a business model follows from that. But first, we have to figure out what we as citizens need to be able to behave and act in a way that uh, retains some sort of uh, power and influence over what is at least for a little while longer a democratic republic. Yeah. Abstracting out from what we all know universities to be to what, universi what problem universities are fundamentally trying to solve. They're trying to solve the problem of how do we make sure research occurs that is valuable to society, that isn't sustainable under capitalism, that isn't self-funding under capitalism. How do we make that operate? And simultaneously, how do we protect research that gives us answers that people don't want to hear? Uh, how do we protect the researcher who comes back with a finding that is yeah. against the interests of industry against the interests interests of government against the interests of advertisers and so that's, the system yeah, sorry. yeah the systems that we have in place in a university including the tenure system fundamentally abstracting that away from what universities generally study and what they produce that they produce academic monographs and articles the system is you have a, a researcher the researcher produces a bunch of good material uh, some funding body judges, yes, this person is producing good material. The person says, I want to continue producing this material. The funding body says, okay, we will give you tenure and a permanent line of funding. Go forth into the world and produce this material. And you right. can imagine that existing for journalists, <clears throat> that there would be a body that says, you've done some great journalism. We want to give you a stipend. Go forth into the world and fill it with good journalism. Uh, this, is, this is fundamentally trying to solve the same problem that universities have solved. And we, well, I'd say we're constantly trying to resolve it because the assault is steady. Um, so, yeah, but, but we, at least we have a language, a tradition, a set of values, and some cultural status, although that is as well eroding. Um, but, yeah, we, 
operate from an assumption that disinterested pursuit of knowledge is a, a good in and of itself, and we rarely have to re-argue that. Um, you know, most of what we do most days takes that for granted, and that's the lovely thing about our jobs. I'm a former journalist, and as a journalist, we constantly have to re-argue that. We constantly have to reassert the disinterested pursuit of knowledge as a core value. You would think it would be a given in the world of journalism, and it is only in the most romantic visions of journalism. But in the real world of journalism, it is not at all. Uh, journalism was only liberated by its economic surplus for about 75 years, or liberated to the extent to which it was, right? So that a journalist at, at um, you know, the Cincinnati Inquirer could actually investigate Chiquita, one of the biggest employers in Cincinnati, for all sorts of abuses in Central America, um, because for a long time that paper ran a surplus, the moment when that paper is in danger, as it has been, the that kind of reporting becomes basically impossible to do. And that's what we've seen with newspapers all over America. And that's why so much of the bolder work is relegated to institutions like ProPublica, uh, which are their, their defining mission is to challenge the status quo and produce disinterested knowledge. I wanted to propose a, a slightly different account of how we got here, which really involves that at the end of uh, the 30 years following the war, we elected politicians who stopped enforcing antitrust law. And so one of the things that happened was that newsrooms became uh, horribly weakened monotonically year after year, uh, regardless of what was happening in technology, right? It wasn't Google who uh, uh, caused all of the little family-owned newspapers <clears throat> to become giant chains who consolidated all of their news gathering in centralized newsrooms uh, with centralized ad sales departments. It was Google who moved into that weakened environment where those firms had already been harmed uh, and started to, to take those weak entities and to kill them off. But the reason they were weak is because of lax antitrust enforcement. And the reason Google got so strong is because of lax antitrust enforcement. And the reason that market ideology is commanding so much of our public discourse and requiring uh, academics to argue over and over again for the value of pursuing knowledge that is not of immediate corporate use is also lax antitrust enforcement. And that we have these three things that are effects, and we spend a lot of time trying to figure out which one of them is the cause. You're reminding me of, of you know, bookstores and, uh, and publishers, and in particular the process where right now we're in a situation where we're watching the giant Amazon beat up uh, the various book publishers like Macmillan that we work with, whereas a little while ago the narrative was Macmillan the giant, which is beating up the small independent publishers that it you know, parasitically dis dismantled in order for the big five publishers to assemble themselves up to the scale that they are. But then Amazon is of an order of magnitude larger than those things, so that our battles between giants and dwarfs, the dwarfs are the giants of the earlier uh, iteration of battles because we have allowed the lax enforcement of antitrust to let things grow in such vast orders of magnitude and so quickly. Well, and, and not only that, but of course, at Macmillan's, the smallest of the big five, Bertelsmann, on the other hand, is the largest publisher in the world. They were allowed to buy Penguin, even though they already owned Random House. They are, th their publishing arm is just a wing of a much larger uh, business entity that mostly makes munitions, but also uh, owns a bunch of newspapers in Germany and commands a lot of German domestic policy and thus EU policy and is one of the prime movers behind Article 11 and the European Copyright Directive. You know, each of these firms is very happy to see antitrust dismantled while they're merging and becoming very large. 
uh, and then each of them becomes very alarmed at the enormity of the other sectors that come and eat their lunches. You know, the, the, the thing that um, Jeff Bezos said when he started Amazon, he said to the publishers, I consider your margin to be my opportunity. And that's that, that you could, you could put that on the tombstone for the first two decades of the 21st century. I'm sorry, may, may I just uh, issue a, a farewell? I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go pick up my child. Um, my wife is also sick today, so I'm having to, um, you know, relieve her of some uh, duty she might have taken had I been able to be in Chicago. So, I, again, I'm terribly sorry, uh, but I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, this is one of my favorite discussions I think I've ever had with a great group of people. Uh, the questions f from the audience uh, have been amazing, really good, really helpful. I'd love to hear more. Please don't hesitate to find me on email uh, and uh, get in contact with me if you want to uh, go any farther with any of the issues that we've talked about. Um, and again, thank you, Ada, for this opportunity. This is, uh, this is really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to, to raise the question about credibility. Um, so... With all the, the talk about the political economy of news organizations and the structuring of, of newspapers and, and the possible alignments between things like universities and, and uh, news organizations, I think there's the, it's almost as though one talks about this as though the, the, uh, the reception of the, the, the Quality, as it were, but quality not in the sense of quality, but the 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 the, uh, the character of the news as news is commodified to the extent that it's independent of these structures. Like the rhetoric of news is, is independent of the structures, and I think historically that hasn't really been true. I think there's a very interesting history of how news attained and sustained and has competed for credibility with other versions of narratives about the world. This is partly to get back to something that Ada mentioned at the break about the, um, the non-elite consumption of news. Um, and if you remember that on the reading list, one of the, the things that we were supposed to look at this week was a piece by Danton about the, I think it was this week, right, for the Information mm -hmm. Society in, in Paris. Where if, if I remember right, that's the one that starts with a tree. Yes. And, um, and he talks about all the, the, the in 18th century Paris. If you were consuming news from newspapers, that's one way in which you get something. But you're also getting things from ballads and sermons and you know libels that are pinned up to trees or doors doorsteps and things well, like that. And uh, we've and got in our history of censorship and information control exhibit, we've got a photograph from I think it's the 19. 40s or 50s from your Chicago campus of a tree that was used <laughs> that way here on campus and people mm -hmm. would pin things to the tree and some of them were political speech and some of them were I have a beanbag chair does anybody want to buy it you know come to my door at this but that the the uh, the, the the practice of having a sort of a collaborative social bulletin board whether it's for satires and pasquinades or whether it's for please buy my beanbag chair, is something that persisted until very, very recently and persists in some spaces. Yeah, and, and what I wanted to point to in a kind of halting way is that, that the, we tend to look back at the preserved records which have come down to us, which are very selective. So we look back and we, we see from the 18th century a record of, say, runs of, of newspapers. Um, or runs of proclamations or something like that. And so we tend to sort of assume that the credibility is, as it were, in the, the documents themselves mm. by themselves. But if you lived in that world, that's, by, that's, that's certainly not the case. You'd be cross-correlating, as it were, yeah. the reports that you would come up with on the, on the page to all of these other things that have, that have left almost no trace, unless you're very fortunate. I mean, in the case of ballads, we do have printed ballads. Mm. Um, but, um, but, but a lot of the stuff like gossip, you can only get at very indirectly and often through uh, jaundiced representations of them. But this is not that different from now. I think, you know, if you, if you go outside of where somebody referred to like living in New York or Washington DC or something where you only read the posh 
posh magazines. If you go outside of that world, maybe even inside that world, much of what you read and how you, how you appropriate it and what you attribute credit to and how you put it to use, what you think carries plausibility and what doesn't, is arrived at through a complex kind of never-ending sort of negotiation between different things that we might call media. So gossip, conventional wisdom, um, uh, you know, television, radio, cinema, books, journals, newspapers, all of those things operate. Graffiti. Graffiti, yeah. I actually happened to live in a house that was next to one of the only permitted graffiti walls in the city oh. until the university bulldozed the wall about oh, five no. years ago to build that horrible tower block down on 53rd Street. <laughs> um, but it was great. The artists were, were terrific. Um, but um, um, actually, it was interesting. My, since you get my, so my daughter actually did a school project on the graffiti artists down there. And she went and interviewed them. And though this story that they told was, was probably not true, it was interesting that what they told her was actually quite a long historical story about where graffiti came from that went back hundreds of years. Hmm. Um, and I thought that was kind of an interesting thing about the constitutive role of, of the stories that we tell about the history of media in, you know, when we, when we think about what media are worth pursuing and worth reading. But anyway, so, so what I wanted to say was that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of constructedness about the credibility of facts, stories and things that we miss when we only look at, at the sort of preserved paper textual records. And we, it, 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 it behooves us to have a kind of imaginative leap and to try to get back into that world where you're constantly judging everything against, against everything else. Concrediting is a 17th century word for this. Concrediting? Concrediting. It comes from, so in the 17th century, there's this, there's this, there's, there's, a, there's a civil war in England in the 17th century. He's several, several civil wars. And they're accompanied by the growth of the first periodical newspapers. And the problem with this for people writing quite soon after the civil wars have calmed down, say 30 years later, is that the records that they have are typically these newspapers, but the newspapers are hopelessly jaundiced. And they make up battles. It's like, this is like Orwell. They make up battles. They make up monstrous births and prodigies and comets that are <laughs> presaging the victory or defeat of one side or another. So what you have is something that you know took place in broad terms. And you know that there was such and such a battle and such and such a date. But trying to reconstruct what actually happened on those dates is fatally compromised hmm. by the, t the textual nature of the, of the records that you have. And the one-time clerk of parliament, his name was John Rushworth, compiled the first documentary history of this period in about 1680 or so. It's called um, Rushworth's Collections. And he has a preface where he explicitly says, this is a major epistemological problem. How can we figure out what the news was when every single news source is interested, biased, fictitious in one way or another? And what he says you should do is this thing called concrediting, where you, you basically sit there with every newspaper you can find covering a certain, they're usually weekly, so you, you cover a week. Um, and you, you basically cross-correlate cross mm -hmm. the claims. So if you find that, say, one newspaper claims that Prince Rupert had a dog that would charge into battle with him, and it was black, and its name was, was what was the name of Prince Rupert's dog? I've actually forgotten the name of Prince Rupert's dog. But anyway, so and so. Then if, if one newspaper reports this, it's probably just because they were trying to insinuate that Prince Rupert was a witch. If four or five report this, then it's probably, then its credibility is four or five times as great because they probably come from semi-independent sources, so it's cross-correlated. As I say, he calls it concrediting. And something like that is a, is a sort of, uh, there's a sociology and a history of practices like that that explain, that, 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 that link the production of news to the reception of news and the way that news operates in society, I think. You're reminding me of the book Evening News by Eileen Reeve, who is another, Eileen mm -hmm. Reeves, who is another scholar I thought about uh, trying to bring in if we had had a, uh, even more weeks to, to do this in, who was looking at the dissemination of news right before 1600, uh, when you would, they were starting to set up what you could call the first news networks, which are people who go to a big town, collect all the you know, copies of letters and whatever rumors and so on they can get, and then get on a horse and ride to a different town.
and then either read it aloud in a pub or present it at a court if there's a local count who has a court, or sometimes if there's a printing press there, uh, print it as a pamphlet and it gets moved on. So the very first news networks are just a guy on a horse who makes a career of going back and forth between two cities as a disseminator of the collected mm -hmm. material. So that the, the, the process of collecting it, and then once you're collecting it, if you have more than one source cross-comparing, uh, is a problem that they're already struggling with before 1600, but much more after. There's another, I actually have to go in a second, but there's another interesting thing. So this last week, uh, in a different class that I was teaching, we read a book by a historian, Peter Lake, called Bad Queen Bess which is about various things, but largely it's about uh, Catholic uh, representations of the nature of politics under Queen Elizabeth I in England. So this is a Protestant regime. It's oppositional Catholics writing tracts that are sort of critical of, of, of political policies in this, this era. And one of the things about it is that there's a common representation in this in, among these Catholics that the Tudor state is operating a, a really Orwellian sort of thought police uh, 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 regime, where not only can, do you have to go through licensing or something like that, but you're, you're really not allowed to think certain ways. And they're, they're incredibly effective, they say, the Catholics. And one of the weird effects of that is that it changes how you read, as it were, the unlicensed tracts. Everybody knows that licensed newspapers are the voices of, of the times, as Francis Bacon says. They're, they're, they're just going to get orthodox stuff. But there's lots of unlicensed tracts. But if, you have, uh, if, if you're a Catholic and you believe that the government has a kind of Orwellian totalitarian control over everything, and there are still unlicensed tracts, you read the unlicensed tracts as in some way coded parts of government discourse, hmm. which is very odd. So you start looking, looking in them for signs about maybe factions within the, the state, or signs for what, what does the state want you to think by impersonating oppositional figures? And you get into this very sort of strange spiral, into a kind of hermeneutic spiral about it. Interesting. Sorry. A, the question is how one can do concrediting. Uh, the, the risk with concrediting is what if one newspaper which made this story about the prince's dog and all the others are copying it from the one that uh, made the story about the prince's dog, which is exactly what you will work on, the fact that newspapers do exactly this, uh, repeating news from others. And we had David Copeland here last week who uh, uh, gave us a long talk in the morning about a fake news article about Lunarians uh, from the 19th century that the, the Sun ran an article, you know, uh, the astronomer has, has gotten detailed images of people living on the moon. And here they are, and here are pictures of them, and here's their society, and they have a utopian society, and they have these laws, and they have these weird animals, and there are unicorns there. And, and the sun is the only source of this, because they made it up. But every newspaper in the world ran it. And it ran in Italy, and it ran everywhere. And nobody could deny that they had copied it from the sun, because it later turned out to be a complete hoax. Uh, but nonetheless, if you were trying to concredit in that way, you would have to do a lot of meticulous work to trace it back and realize, oh, this is pinpoint one source not multiple sources. So that's just a constant challenge with the, the question of concreditation, and you have to look into where the sources come from, in yeah, effect. Yeah, it, it, it becomes a kind of forensic skill. But this is Will's world of the Well, yeah. no, I mean, I think, uh, just to react a little bit to what's being said, I mean, I think, uh, absolutely, just knowing that a newspaper was published or how many copies were printed doesn't tell us much. We need to know how people interacted with them and how the different forms of, of media were weighed against each other. And for almost every period, we see evidence of this, that, that people do read skeptically, that they do compare sources and so on. And it's not always easy, but the fact that they are engaging in the process. So, so people do this today too, right? And the question is, are there certain, are there certain built-in features of the media system that make this harder or easier to do? Are there certain sort of new, new inertias that form that, that you know, even if people are skeptical, they have to work harder? to compare the different sources and to get out of their filter bubbles. Um, so I think absolutely, the history of news is the history of um, you know, the way people interact with each other, because news doesn't mean much outside of the, the interactions that, that generate it and the discussions that follow from it. So we absolutely need to have you know, the history of reception at, at the center of this. And we need to think about you know, the way people 
interact with news today and whether or not there are certain modifications that we could make that, you know, that would... Uh, facilitate concreditation, facilitate yeah. other forms of critical thinking. Yeah. So uh, th one of the elements there that's, that's uh, come up that maybe we can connect is the way that concre concreditation cuts against uh, paywalls and, and also exclusive rights to control links. That uh, and I, and I had this debate once on stage with with a very high ranking member of the Democratic Party, a politician, who was arguing for the public good of the New York Times and why therefore they should have a paywall so they can sustain themselves. And I reminded this politician that the Times had also uh, lied about the cause of going into Iraq, and that if the Times uh, controlled our ability to link to it, then our ability to criticize it the next time it did something so unworthy would be compromised by our ability to pay to see what was behind there in the archive. Uh, and that this, you know, goes several levels deep. It would also be compromised by our right to make an archival copy and display it and compromised by our right to link to them in this European copyright directive perspective and if we expect people to do truth investigations, but in the service of maintaining truth-seeking organizations, we limit their ability to do those truth investigations, then we arrive at an impasse. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one of the, the most troubling things about Article 11 that, that you're referring to is, is that it, the publishers know that if they stayed in the realm of normal copyright law, they would not be able to get internet platforms to pay them. Uh, they would not be able to use the law to get internet platforms to pay for the use of short snippets or headlines of news. There's too many exceptions that have grown up, and for good reasons, um, and often it's been cases involving news that have created these distinctions and exceptions. But for example, the Berne Convention uh, that uh, all the most countries are members of has a, a quotation right, so there's an exception to copyright that you can quote from works, and in particular, there's uh, their quotation in the form of press summaries. And this is very important for a pluralistic press for people to be able to report what other news organizations are reporting and to perform a kind of uh, a kind of aggregation so that we can see what the different versions of the story are and so on. And the other thing is the exception for short phrases and titles, which have almost always been excluded from copyright. It would be very difficult to, you know, if you want to claim a copyright on a title, that means nobody can cite the title in, you know, an exchange, in an investigation, uh, and a, a critical commentary. So they know this. And they also know that under European law, a lot of short phrases wouldn't rise to the level of intellectual effort of an author in order to generate copyright. So they're creating this, this separate right, which is a neighboring right, uh, based on the investment of publishers. And aside from the fact that you know, we don't think it's actually going to work, it does indeed um, pose this danger that it cuts against the important exceptions that we need to be able to cite other people's work, to be able to link to it, to be able to uh, use short extracts and so on, to be able to search for things that we need and comment on them. Um, you're reminding me of some of the discussions we had about fair use and the trickiness of fair use as a metric. You know, there, there, are, there, there is fair use policy. It varies country by country, but, you know, within the U.S., there are circumstances where, you know, just reproducing this uh, without modification would violate copyright, but reproducing this work of art and discussing it is fair use, and so you're allowed to have the image. Maybe. But the edges of what is fair use and what isn't are very fuzzy. How long a quotation are you allowed to have before it stops being fair use or not uh, is very fuzzy. And often the practical reality is th it depends entirely on the litigiousness of the copyright holder, whether they will come after you and sue you for doing the thing or not, mm -hmm. which is actually what usually determines whether you practically can do this. Uh, uh, buffered to some extent by your own financial position and power and whether you are part of a group that affords to have a lawyer on staff whose job it is to defend you from a litigious uh, uh, company versus whether you are an individual. 
But it's very well known among people who do reporting, who do the making of, of fan music videos, who do all sorts of things, which companies are and aren't pushier uh, when you're lit and, and more litigious and therefore difficult to work with. So for example, uh, anime music videos are a large fan produced thing, right? Fans take footage out of their favorite anime, they set it to a, to a piece of music and they make a new thing. And some producers and licensors of anime consider this an excellent practice because it's basically free advertising. Instead of them putting together a trailer, someone else has put together a trailer and it circulates and it makes people interested in the success of the show. And you know, there have been series that have been, been made into bestsellers. Princess Tutu, for example, which contrary to what the title Princess Tutu might imply is an incredibly dark, gritty, grim fantasy. Uh, and was an absolute flop when it first came out in the US because it was called Princess Tutu. Uh, but then a major fan-made video circulated and it became a, a success as a result. But there are other companies, notably Disney, which holds the licenses for the Miyazaki movies, which will come after you in an instant if you circulate any fan-made material that features them, to the degree that at one point, when I was working with Anime Boston, an anime convention in uh, Boston, we uh, had events, an event called the Anime Dating Game, where people dressed up as anime characters would do the dating game, and it was funny, and people filmed it and put it on YouTube. And they got a cease or desist order whenever the person was doing a costume from something that Disney had the rights to. Now this is absolutely fair use, and if there had been a lawsuit, the person who made the costume would almost certainly have won. But there is no way that this you know, 15 year old cosplayer who enthusiastically hand stitched her beautiful Ursula outfit uh, would, would be able to spend the man hours and money on a lawsuit to defend this video. So the video goes down simply because of the litigiousness of the rights holder having nothing to do with whether it falls under fair use or doesn't fall under fair use. So when that happens, you have a situation where fair use is more robustly useful for someone who works for a larger company that has a team of lawyers ready to defend you, again, privileging the ability to speak of larger organizations against individuals and smaller organizations. Yeah, I mean, the strength and the weakness of fair use is the flexibility and the fact mm -hmm. that it has to be interpreted. So if you don't, uh, if, you, if you don't, if you aren't sure, chances are you, you won't do it. You'll self-censor, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. Um, you know, there's, there was a study about, oh, about six or seven years ago of journalists and whether or not journalists understood fair use and the extent to which they used it to do their work because journalists have to all the time be reproducing text or images that, that belongs to a rights holder, but there are certain you know, exceptions that they can use for the purposes of reporting a current event. But it turned out in this survey that, that journalists weren't fully aware of what the limits of what they could do, and in fact, the way they did their job was mostly based on whatever in-house um, traditions had been set up. You know, what were things we need to avoid? What are things that we should and should not do? And based on this survey, um, uh, Peter Yazzie and Patricia Aufterheider, who've worked a lot on creating codes of be best practices for fair use. They've done this with documentary filmmakers. They've done it with educators. They've done it with journalists and so on, trying to ac actually educate people and, and show them what they can and cannot do with fair use. Because otherwise, people will indeed self-censor and not, not take advantage of it. Because you want to err on the side of protecting yourself from a life-destroying legal problem uh, most yeah, of the time. As, as, as Larry Lessig says, uh, fair use is the right to hire a lawyer. Um, uh, guys, I, I have to go as well. It's my 10th wedding anniversary. Uh, <laughs> thank you. All credit to my wife, but I have to go get ready. All right, thank We're you for joining us. All right, talk to you later. Uh, do we have other Ooh. questions? I'm sure we do. Other questions people like, yes. Yeah. So the question is about benefactor funding models when you have a wealthy person who gives money to fund a chunk of journalism or, or a university or, or an equivalent and whether how that is affected by or, or affect the degree to which there will be an agenda or a particular bias or a particular focus, whether it's a political one or serving the economic interests of that benefactor, et cetera, and how those feature in. I mean, the, the problem with this as a model is that it all depends on how benign or you know, how um, 
how committed the person is to the, to the product. So at the moment, uh, this has sort of given a new lease on life to the Washington Post and everything seems to be going okay and they've got access to greater funds and so on. But is that sustainable? I mean, what happens afterwards? That's why I think something like a foundation model is, is sort of more interesting as a you know, long-term something where you know, the, the community that's invested in it can actually sustain it and you're not dependent on you know, the, the, the whims of a single mm -hmm. person. So the, the whims of a single person can, can end up with a very positive product, but it could also end up with something you know, quite toxic. So, I mean, that's sort of the problem, the problem with that. I, and I certainly agree that the, the old advertising model was not perfect either, um, and that we need to sort of think beyond that. Um, and um, you know, to, to expand on that, I think one of the, one of the big differences, there are, are different ways that benefactor-based funding of anything can happen. And one is the, main, the relationship with the benefactor continues. Right? The benefactor writes a new check every year. The mm -hmm. benefactor continues to be involved. The other is the benefactor sets it up As and steps away yeah. and has no future power over that thing. And those two are very, very different from each other because you can have a person who sets it up, you know, provides the endowment or whatever it is, says, you know, you are the people I want to put in charge go and then steps back and has no future capacity to interfere with that process and that creates a much freer and opener space than when there is a continued relationship. Whether that continued relationship is a check every year or even when that continued relationship is the hope of another check uh, mm. from that donor. And if you talk, for example, to the, um, to the, uh, don uh, the, the fundraising branches of this university and other universities, They've observed over time that when they're dealing with donors, donors are getting much less willing to just give a chunk of money mm. and much more desirous of giving a bit and then a bit more and then a bit more and earmarking exactly what the donations are going to be for. This donation is going to be specifically for financial aid, specifically in this field, specifically for this type of student. That it becomes nearly impossible to get people to just give money and say, I trust you to decide how to use this money. And if Corey were here, he talks delightfully about something he uh, called a Ulysses Compact. Uh, so the, the reference is in the Odyssey. There's the moment where Ulysses wants to hear the song of the sirens. And so he tells his men, tie me to the mast, and no matter what you do, don't untie me from the mast. And his men tie him to the mast, and as they're going past the sirens, he's begging them untie me, untie me, untie me, but he made that compact and they won't, and so he can't, and in, in the Odyssey, it, uh, it saves his life. Cord uses this to talk about code and making code open access, because you'll develop a thing and you know, you'll, you'll support the, pr the principles of open access and you'll support the principles of making this available to everyone, and then at some point, someone will come and say, we will give you a life-changing amount of money if you let us license the thing. And it's very different at that moment to look at that life-changing amount of money and look at what it would mean for you and what it means for your power to help your friends, to help political movements you support, to help dozens of different things that you realize you could do good at if you didn't release that thing. But if when you first made it, you released it and it's out there, you're tied to the mast, you can't change it. And it creates a situation in which you have armored your current principles against your future self, against your future self's weakness, uh, and your future self's capacity to be swayed by perceiving how much you could do if you changed your mind. And so in that way, sense, when we're talking about creating a foundation to support the news, if it's the foundation where the donor is gonna come back every year, and, and at any moment they could decide they didn't like what that news foundation was doing and stop, then you're gonna have even if that person never actually demands a particular bias, you're gonna have the fear on the part of the journalist of wanting to please the interests of that figure. Uh, but if it were done with a Ulysses compact, if it were, here is the money, make, get, select a board, I cannot affect this further, I am stepping aside. That's how you can have a foundation that nonetheless is armored against bias uh, based on at least the funding source as a, as a, as a threat. Um, but the, the other thing I would want to say on that topic is just every funding source is hackable. Just as every way of setting up a government is hackable, right? And they all have failure modes. 
and democracy is hackable and has a failure mode, and monarchy is hackable and has a failure mode, and aristocracy is hackable and has a failure mode, and the insane Florentine Renaissance system of pick picking citizens at random out of a bag and making them be in charge of the state for two to three months at a time arbitrarily while locked in a tower, <laughs> I kid you not, uh, was hackable. All systems are hackable. But if you diversify the number of different things, they aren't all hackable by the same failing condition. So if you have your journalism all be funded by advertising, then something that makes the advertising revenue be undermined will undermine your whole journal. But if your journal has subscribers and advertising and people who pay a dollar a week to have the crossword puzzle one day in advance and uh, uh, sells anthologies of the cartoons that it runs and gets some of the money from that and has two or three other funding models and has a, fa a donor who makes it be a foundation, then even when the donor becomes corrupt and terrible, the re other revenue streams are still there. So following the same principle that the founders of the American experiment took from Montesquieu's spirit of the laws of the idea of having division of government so that there are different branches and the different branches have different hackabilities, different failure modes. So similarly, as we think about funding something important, whether that thing is a university or whether that thing is journalism, if we can diversify the funding streams, it becomes buffered against the different historical circumstances and political pressures that can trigger the failure mode of any one of those funding streams. So the question is about sponsored content. When the show Orange is the New Black funds, you know, pays for a newspaper to run a series on prisons, it's journalism, it's also advertising. What is it? How does it, how does it mesh with news I mean, there, and news there, history? There's a long history of this. I mean, you, you look at the, the rise of advertising agencies in the 19th century. This is one thing that they figured out very early on. And they, they, had, they had a power very early on that they said, you know, we'll give you X number of advertisements and we'll pay for them. But you've also got to run it next to a story which drops, you know, references to this product or it more, you know, more, um, more discreetly, as you're suggesting, is on a topic that is related to the thing. So uh, newspapers have had to deal with this for a long time. It's always been there. And I think that is one of the problems of the advertising model. Who wrote that great work on bread? There's a great book on sliced bread, which we have this expression, the greatest thing since sliced bread, which really means the greatest thing since 1912. Um, but uh, but um, it's a book on the dissemination of the practice of buying your bread in a grocery store as opposed to mm. buying your bread, uh, baking your bread at home. Uh, and that up until, you know, through the 1910s, something like 70 or 80 percent of America's bread was baked in the home. And by 1925 or so, it, was, it had reversed, and 80% of it is being bought in stores. And one of the things that happened in that transition is that huge marketing campaigns for store-brought bread, you know, for scientific bread with pictures of men in white lab coats producing bread, which looks like a rocket ship, or at least is long and thin, and is next to a picture of a rocket ship. The idea that it was carefully balanced by scientists who knew more than you about what was healthy for your family, et cetera. You know, and the advertisements for the bread were run alongside these exposés that the bread companies paid for about the bad hygiene of bakeries. And part of it was a xenophobia thing, these bakeries being run by immigrants, uh, and you don't know what they're allowing to be near the bread, that, that, that was using uh, sponsorship of articles in conjunction with sponsorship of advertisements to, to uh, sort of create a market for a product that had not been a marketed product. Before. So this is a very old problem within advertising-oriented journalism. Could I, could I change the subject a little yeah, bit? Yeah, please What's do. A, because this, this class is about the history of censorship and information control. And this week is particularly about copyright and news. So I wanted to just maybe make explicit some of the connections here. And I know that in one of the earlier sessions, uh, Adrian Johns talked about how copyright has its origins in um, state censorship practices, that in fact the, the licensing regimes or the privilege regimes of early modern Europe were you give permission to a printer to print a particular book, so you're authorizing it as a censor, and you give them that exclusively so that they are the only person who can print that particular book. And you can also do it with different kinds of works. So that's, 
that's where that comes from. And the, the, cru the crucial distinction is when the censorship and copyright are separated in the 18th century. And that's when you start to get thinking about there's going to be some other purpose to it besides just controlling who does what. And as early as the 18th century, people were starting to worry about the idea that, censor that copyright could be used as a tool of censorship. So there was a, a debate at the end of the 18th century, and the example that was given was, well, what if a political figure um, does something corrupt or something dangerous, and somebody writes a pamphlet about it, and then that political figure, a minister of state or whatever, buys up the whole print run and buys the copyright so that nobody can produce it anymore. He would therefore, you know, restrict and use censorship, you use copyright as a means of censorship. In other words, using the monopoly right to not allow information or whatever to circulate. Well, and this, and this seems, done... seems like something that we've moved beyond, but I just wanted to say that just yesterday I read that in Germany uh, there, there is a case going through the courts where mm -hmm. There was a leak of documents. So every week, the uh, German military produces a report of uh, what the military is doing. And this is given to certain members of the legislature. It's given to certain members of the government. Some of them leaked, decided to leak this to, to the media. A newspaper ran with it, started printing excerpts from these military reports and commenting on them. And the German government decided, well, if we try to censor this, if we try to say this is about, you know, state, state national security, we're going to be doing, we're going to be acting in a censorship way, and this is going to create a backlash and a public outcry. So we're not going to do this. Instead, we're going to sue them for copyright infringement, because they didn't have the right to reproduce these military reports. So this is now in the courts, and the German court has asked the European Court of Justice um, to determine a point of law. Two points, actually. Can a military report of just brute facts be subject to copyright? And two, if it can, can a government use copyright to limit reporting on current events? And we don't know what the European Court of Justice is going to say, but yesterday, the advocate general, who is a, an independent lawyer, who is appointed to give an opinion to the Court of Justice, in other words, I've studied the issue and I think this is how the point of law should be decided, said that, first of all, he doesn't think that a military report, which is just times and places and names and dates and movements, can be copyrighted because it doesn't ar arise to the level of intellectual effort. And secondly, even if it could be, that would be a restriction on freedom of expression. And freedom of expression is a fundamental human right. And although it has to be subject to other rights like property right and copyright, a state can't use its property right in a text to limit discussion and expression uh, of freedom of expression. So this tension between censorship and copyright is playing out right now, even though we don't think you know, a state would do that. It's surprising that they ran this way, but they were doing it again because they didn't want to look like they were censoring. right? That's, um, and, and yet the copyright is, can, can be used that way. Well, it's very parallel to what I talked about with New Zealand's early enforcement of obscenity law through the postal system. Mm. Uh, that you know, New Zealand didn't have an, a, a censor's office in the in the 1890s yet, but they did have a postal system, and so they could it, uh, uh, empower mm -hmm. their postal system to open all packages arriving in New Zealand and to confiscate sure. goods that they considered to be against a particular law. It's a government using a different branch that was developed for a different reason mm -hmm. to attempt to circumscribe the movement of information. And that's why this project always tries to use the phrase censorship and information control together. Mm -hmm. Because they can't ever be separated from each other. Because things such as copyright, which we think of as, yes, it's information control, but it doesn't aim to silence, mm -hmm. can always be used to silence, or at least attempt to be used to silence in different circumstances. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to create any system of information control which cannot be reused to silence strategically by someone who's sitting down in a clever way to figure that out. So just as we looked at the 1951 case where the budgeting of school clubs here at the University of Chicago was used to shut down the Maroon because they had a communist editor, right? the budgeting system for school clubs is in no way designed to be a mode of censorship but it could operate as one. 
And because systems of information control are indeed oriented around information and about circumscribing the movement of information, it's even easier for those to be repurposed for purposes of silencing and censoring than most other parallel structures which have and can be repurposed for this end. I don't think we touched quite as much as I'd hoped, so I'll, I'll use our, our remaining minutes to poke at this a little bit, about the importance of thinking about elite versus non-elite consumption of these kinds of materials, particularly for the pre-modern world. And this is a funny thing to say, but over and over I see us underestimating the literacy of illiterate people. Uh, because we look at these numbers about earlier centuries and we see it has a 30% literacy rate or it has a 50% literacy rate, et cetera, and we sort of act as if that means there's this large slice of the population that is unaffected by what's happening in print, that doesn't hear about and doesn't care about the debates that are happening in print. So there's a scene in Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale in which a ballad monger comes to the rural farm, right? And there are the farmers who gather around, and this is a ballad monger, and he's an itinerant peddler, the kind who goes around selling little ribbons and little icons of saints and little things. And part of what he's selling are little printed pamphlets that are a ballad. And it'll have a new tune, and it'll have lyrics, or it'll have lyrics to sing to an old tune. And some of them will be political and will be news. It'll be about the marriage of the prince or it'll be about the siege that just happened somewhere. And others will be a love story or a, or a scandal rag. Uh, but these ballads are a form of news dissemination. And in this scene in Shakespeare's play, the, the shepherds all gather around him and say, you know, tell me what this one says. Tell me what this one says. What are they about? Asking the ballad monger to tell them who cannot read what the ballads are about and they then buy all of his ballads, because there is this large market among illiterate consumers for buying literary material, because they're going to take it to a literate friend, often to the pastor right, or the local priest, and have it read aloud to them and memorize it and have it and have access to it through that secondary medium. And there's a practice of people going to pubs and reading aloud the news in those public spaces. And a number that always blows people's minds uh, book historians who've looked at quantitative material, uh, looking at the publication of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, which is this formative inflammatory pamphlet that is uh, a big part of the intellectual discourse around the American Revolution. More copies of Common Sense were printed than there were people living in the colonies. And yet the literacy rate is well below 50%. So what does this mean? It means the market for common sense isn't about reading it. The market for common sense is about having it, about participating, about feeling that you're part of this community. So these illiterate people care very deeply about elite debates over whether John Locke or Thomas Hobbes is correct about their readings of human nature, which filtered through Thomas Paine turn into the political foundations of the US. So there's a vast participation in what we would think of as the unlearned slice of the population in what we think of as the most learned things that are going on in a society through these interpenetrations. And I think we tend to exclude that from the way we imagine the consumption of information in the past. And thus, I think we probably also do so in the present. And when we're talking about the graffiti wall next to Adrian Johns's house, we're talking about an indispensable component of what transmits and shapes our ideas, just as com uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense did uh, in the 1770s. Yeah, the, the comment, we have, a, we have a librarian in the audience and it's always valuable to call on librarians in any circumstance. But the, the general observation that lack of formal education doesn't make, mean that a person is stupid, nor in the broader sense does it mean that the person is disengaged from major debates. Uh, people are deeply engaged in major debates and access them through innumerable channels, which are all part of this network we call news. And on that front, we will see you next week for more. Thank you all.